now we have to talk about coping strategies. What is a coping strategy? Well, coping strategy is really your response to a series of events. And we can use all different types of coping strategies. Your immediate response, the very involuntary response, is really that fight, flay, or freeze. But then we can go on to do something that could potentially be more conscious. It could also be unconscious in lots of ways or just automatic. But we have the potential to eventually get more control over our coping strategies. And some of us take very different ways. I want you to think about three scenarios. Think about how you would respond. Imagine you get a test back that you tried really hard at, but you failed. How would you respond to that situation? What would you think about? Who would you blame? What would your actions be next in coping with that? Would you have to talk to someone? Would you write something? What would you do? Another situation, let's say you are dumped by your significant other. How would you respond to that situation? What would your next actions be? Now, finally, let's say you're on your way to a job interview, but you're going to be late, like significantly late, like 10 minutes late to the job interview. What are you going to do? What's going to be running through your head? Who are you going to blame? Who are you going to talk with? What is going on in your mind? So the failed test, the romantic relationship breakup and the late job interview, how would you cope with all three of these events? Well, you may cope in a way that we would consider to be externalizing. Externalizing is when you have an external attribution and you blame others. This is the idea if you fail a test, you blame the teacher, you blame the test, you blame the school, you blame someone other than you. It's the idea that if you are broken up with, you blame the other person. You say they didn't see what they were missing out on. You say it's their fault, they're pig headed. Or if you're late for a job interview, it's the idea, oh, it was traffic. It was this and this. It was the directions were not good. It's the elevator didn't work. And you try and shift the blame. So it's not you, it's something else. So externalizing is really blaming others. And once we've made the cognitive commitment that we're going to blame others, the types of actions we tend to take are out against others. So people who take a more externalizing coping strategy are more likely to rise to things like using physical and social aggression to cope with their frustrations and to cope with their stress. This is the idea that if something's not going your way and you're very frustrated, you may exhibit a loss of hostile aggression where you just lash out and you throw a controller or you break something in your room or you punch a pillow. So that's using physical aggression to deal with your emotions. Now some of us try and use physical aggression against property and not things like as mentioned, punching a pillow, but, uh, this is, but this is still externalizing and this is still physical aggression. We can also see people use things like social aggression. This is when they use gossip and they blame others. So if you make the mental commitment that it's not your fault that you failed the test as the teacher, maybe you're going to badmouth the teacher. Maybe you're going to badmouth the school. Maybe you're going to write something negative about them because that's going to help you to cope with your frustrations. Now these externalizing coping strategies in isolation are just end there. But if a person uses these all the time and it's their main coping technique, what this can lead to is a variety of health consequences and health behaviors. So if a person routinely externalizes things and almost always externalizes things using physical or social aggression and is always blaming others, they're going to experience a lot of hostility. They may actually be a person that we call type A personality. We didn't talk about type A personality when we talked about our personality unit because it's not actually a personality type. But what this is, type A personality is characterized by a person who is very impatient, they're very controlling, and they're very hostile. And the impatience and the perfectionistic and the controlling nature is not so much of a problem, but it's the hostility. We find people with type A personality that are very hostile. They have heightened blood pressure, they have more muscle tension, and yes, when they get to middle adulthood, they are at a heightened increased chance for heart disease, for heart attacks, and for strokes. And so this increased stress that they're carrying because they want to be perfect and they want others to be perfect and they are very impatient and they don't like having to wait around for others and they're very hostile is going to put them at a much bigger chance of increased stress and for cardiovascular disease. In addition, if a person is constantly blaming others and with their physical or social aggression, they're going to be at an increased risk for physical confrontations. And this may lead to increased experiences with physical violence and fighting. So they may experience a lot of injuries and bruises and batterings because of this blaming. 
And finally, with the social aggression, if they're constantly gossiping and blaming others and being two-faced, well, this is going to have major relationship outcomes. They may be at increased chances of not having a long-term relationship. They may have a series of breakups or divorces. This may lead them to experience isolation. And it also could have a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, as we learned about in Unit 12. This is the idea if they're hostile towards others and think others have it out for them, and they act that way, then others probably will not like them, and then that'll become a spiral and a loop where because they can't trust others, others won't trust them, and then they'll be in this constant loop. So externalizing coping strategies are not considered adaptive, they're considered very maladaptive, and are not considered beneficial to either a physiological or psychological well-being. An opposite of this externalizing coping strategy is internalizing. And this is where a lot of us in modern society find ourselves. This is the idea we don't blame others, we blame ourselves. If you fail a test, you say, oh my gosh, I'm a failure. Oh my gosh, I screwed up. I am a failure at life. Oh no. If somebody breaks up with you, you say, oh, I wasn't worthy of it. I guess I can't keep a relationship. I guess I'm not good enough. If you're late for a job interview, you say, oh my goodness, I couldn't, I should have known there was going to be a traffic jam on 32nd. I should have known that the elevator wasn't going to work. And you start to blame yourself. So this internalizing coping strategy is using an internal attribution style and is blaming and taking all the frustration inward. And what we find is people can do a lot of what we call rumination. And so rumination is when they continue to think about an embarrassing or problematic event over and over and over again in their head. But this is not an adaptive type of rationalization. It's just repeating the trauma over and over and over again and hurting yourself. And it's the idea you think, oh, remember that one time I really messed up a job interview? Oh, that was so embarrassing. And you're not learning from it. You're not learning from your mistake. You're just torturing yourself. So rumination is not considered to be good. Another thing that happens with internalization is avoidance. And so avoidance is when something's really problematic and now you don't want to think about the test. You don't want to open up your grades. You don't want to try and date again. You don't want to apply for other jobs because you're so scared of messing it up again. And so this is when we just stop trying. Another type of avoidance is when we don't necessarily stop trying, but we want to stop ruminating. So we try and distract ourselves and we try to distract ourselves through, through eating or drinking or biting our nails or pulling our hair. And this can lead to a lot of health consequences. First off, some of them are pretty small. Like if you're using distraction, like biting your fingernails or pulling your hair or fidgeting, that doesn't seem like a major problem until you have no nails left or no hair left. And so that is a bit more mild, but a lot of people use substances to get their mind up something, to avoid thinking about a problem. And whether they're using recreational or medicinal substances and whether they're using them as prescribed or not, sometimes this is helping them not to face their problems head on. And this can lead us down the pathway of addiction and substance abuse. And it's the idea that, yeah, using one cigarette to calm yourself down doesn't seem like that bad of an issue until you're a chain smoker and at a much heightened risk of lung disease. And having one glass of wine to deal with the stress of a day doesn't seem that bad until you absolutely need to drink half a bottle of wine every day and you have a bad liver. And so we can see that not dealing with your stress and using these substances to deal with your stress for you can cause other physiological issues down the road. Even with substances that are not seemingly super addictive, something like food, we need food to live, overeating can be used to lower our stress level and can therefore become addictive. And so to better understand this, let's jump into how our coping techniques can be related to our health behaviors. We know that today in Canada, some of the biggest causes of disease are things like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. And we know that this has a lot to do with the Canadian lifestyle. Drinking beer and eating sugary donuts is not good for us in the long term. The Canadian diet is something that will eventually cause a disease that will most likely kill us. So we're just kind of stuck on it. We're going to eat, we're going to distract ourselves, we're going to go for our fatty barbecue foods, or we're going to go for our sugary foods, or we're going to go for our alcohol. And this is very common in almost every human culture ever has had some of these that we're really driven towards. And the reason why this is so enticing is because it influences our pleasure center of our brain, the mesolimbic pleasure center. And even when we're not using something like an addictive substance, we can still get hooked on these addictions. 
And that's because things like going shopping when you're stressed out or watching a TV to avoid doing your work or getting addicted to things like sex or gambling or social media, they also stimulate our mesolimbic pleasure center. And so these are things that when you're really stressed out, we tend to try and look for happiness in online shopping or happiness on Netflix. And our true happiness is not there. Our true happiness is dealing with our stressors and dealing with something head on. Yet these become the cycle that we go to and you can become addicted to anything physiological or psychological. So you might become addicted to a video game, even though it's not a drug because it has that dopamine rush in your mesolimbic pleasure center. And so we need to talk about addictions. So when, if you are experiencing an addiction, this can be a very, very intense addiction or a more managed addiction. You might be someone who's like a weekend alcoholic, let's say, or you only let yourself go and binge on your video games once a month. If you are experiencing an addiction, you can take some small steps on your own. For instance, you can start to journal. When do you do it? When do you splurge all your money on an online casino? When do you online shop uncontrollably? Who are you with when you do it? How does doing it make you feel? Just journal it every time you do it. When does it happen? Who are you with? What's going on in your life? And if you can think about the future and say, okay, I'm not gonna beat this addiction overnight. I can't go cold turkey. What are some reasonable limits I can set for myself? How many beers am I allowed to drink next time? How many hours will I be allowed to play my video game for next time? Think about some reasonable limits for next time and think about some alternatives you can do. Instead of having to rush out and spend a lot of money on something the next time you're feeling down, what are some alternatives you can take? Important to understand people can be addicted to their work and that's because their work gives them a sense of fulfillment and makes them feel accomplished. And a lot of people can throw ourselves into our work and neglect other aspects of our lives. So that could be included in here as an addiction. 